the story of the blowing the whistle on the US Army clubs and messes scandal was told in the Khaki Mafia. What's the difference between the Khaki Mafia and the first book in the Juni Moon trilogy, Goodbye Juni Moon? Goodbye Juni Moon um, is basically the, the story of the Khaki Mafia, but when I did the Khaki Mafia, um, my co-author was Robin Moore. Uh, Robin Moore, as some of you may remember, was the author of the book The French Connection, which was made into a movie, and also The Green Beret, which John Wayne made into a movie. Um, but Robin said we had to fictionalise it. And I was always sad that we fictionalised it because it was such an incredible story that I didn't think it needed any of that embellishment because the story itself was so dramatic. So I was always determined I was going to write it again and write the exact true story, names and everything as they were correctly. So that's how I started with the, the Goodbye Juni Moon. Juni Moon Rising picks up literally the day after Goodbye Juni Moon ends. Uh, it begins with you being approached by Robin to co-write the Carter Mafia. But Juni Moon Rising unfolds as a tale of two distinct parts. Tell us about it. Yes, Juni Moon Rising started uh, after after I testified in the United States Senate against the corrupt sergeants who were running the army clubs in Vietnam. And once the hearing was over, I kind of was at a loss. And don't forget, I'd just come out of Vietnam, so I think I was suffering a form of PTSD. I know that's tossed around that phrase so often now, but um, I was finding myself very lost in New York City, very, very lost. I'd been on all the television programs and on all the news programs. I was in every newspaper. I was in Time and Newsweek magazine for testifying in the Senate hearings. And um, one day I had a phone call from Robin Moore and uh, he said he was interested in writing the story with my cooperation and so we co-authored that one together. Uh, we went down to Jamaica and we were down there for many months. We wrote that one in uh, the USA in New York and in Jamaica. <clears throat> but in the month that uh, we, or a year, it took a year for them to publish it after we sold it, um, I traveled to Europe waiting. But Goodbye Juni, uh, Juni Moon Rising, was the story after I, I wrote the book with Robin, I lived on a houseboat in Florida and I had my own TV talk show in Channel 21 out of Dania, Florida. And uh, I had this desire to adopt children. I had that desire ever since Vietnam when I saw orphans on the street or I'd seen them in other parts of Asia too. But it was very hard to adopt in those days, and particularly if you're a single woman, so I didn't know how I was going to do it. Eventually, I think I fell into the life more of a party girl, just having a good time and trying to push all the serious stuff out of my mind. Um, I didn't want to think about the war if I could help it. I didn't want to think about the children. I bought a really terrific floating home in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I lived on it partly in Lauderdale and moved it also down to Florida, down to Biscayne Bay, down to Miami. And uh, I had lots of good times just doing my weekly TV show and throwing parties on my beautiful houseboat. But things change and after a while I decided I wanted to do something else and I, I did start thinking about the children again. It was pretty hard for me to do because I had to be married to adopt children. And uh, I finally had a relationship with a man who seemed interested in me and in the thought of adopting a ch at least one child. And because of meeting him, I left Florida where I was really very happy and I moved to Alaska 
because he owned a trucking company in Alaska. But no sooner did I arrive in Alaska, in Alaska than he decided to go to Hawaii because he'd just bought a ship there and he had to spend six months refurbishing that ship. He told me to run the trucking company oh, for a person who knew nothing whatsoever about trucks and really knew nothing about Alaska and had never lived in a cold climate. It was rather challenging to say the least. My truck drivers were all teamsters. They didn't like having a lady giving them orders, so they gave me hell. But I did that for quite a while until my husband finished working on, we married in the meantime, and uh, my husband came back to Alaska and said, I'm going to sell the trucking company. The ship's ready to go. We're going to go, um, we're going to go to sea and fish for king crab. And I said, well, good, you, off you go. How long will you be gone for? And he said, what do you mean, how long will I be gone for? He said, you're coming too. The crew needs somebody to cook for them. I said, I don't think so. I have no desire in the middle of winter, which is when you uh, fish for king crab, I have no desire to be out in the middle of the ocean between Russia and Alaska. But he convinced me, and I did go to sea, and I did, um, I did uh, um, cook for the crew on the Alaska Gulf, the name of our vessel. Uh, after that, he did reward me, and we applied to adopt our first child. And that book ends where I'm at the airport in New York, waiting to pick up my first child from India. Jimmy Moon changes course, follows on from that latter half of Jimmy Moon Rising. Um, though it's different from the first two books in many ways, it's equally dramatic and very candid. Do you feel that you've had a life full of drama? <laughs> yes, and then some. It's not been a normal life, and as I always consider myself a very ordinary person, I'm not quite sure how I fell into the life that I fell into. I think it's because whenever I was given a challenge, I rose to that. I didn't let it scare me or deter me. Um, I always pushed ahead, rushed in where, what is the saying, you fools rush in where angels fear to tread. That was always me. Uh, that's just my nature, I suppose. But we adopted the first boy from India, and one day he said to me, Mum, he said, it was never lonely in India. There were other children to play with, and we lived on a rural property. And he said, I'm very lonely here. He said, I have no, no friends. So I said to my husband, he was still going to sea. By then I'd, of course, stopped going to sea. I had to take care of my child. But I said, we need to get a brother for Ben because he said he's lonely. So we went ahead and we uh, adopted a second child from India who was only a little bit younger than the first child. That was fine, but I was never satisfied. During that time, I'd come to know quite a bit about adoptions, and I'd started doing a lot of volunteer work with different uh, organizations such as Heal the Children. And I had a great empathy for children that were sick, that were orphaned, that were having a miserable life. And I just had a desire to do more. And I finally convinced my, and I knew that the older children had almost no chance whatsoever because the older they are, the more they've been damaged and the harder they are to, um, to deal with. But I did finally convince my husband. <laughs> Took a little bit of time, but I convinced him to allow me to adopt a 13-year-old. We did eventually through fate, not through choice, we ended up adopting two 13-year-olds within the same year. And I have to say that was very, very difficult because they were both unused to authority. They were used to doing their own thing and uh, they resented me telling them what to do. 
Nevertheless, we all persevered and um, it eventually worked out. But that would have been it. We, well, I mean, we were going to have one, then we ended up with two, then we ended up with three, then we ended up with four. We thought that was the end of it. And really, I had my hands full by that time. But one day there was a knock on the door and the social services from Tacoma, which is just south of Seattle, they said, we have two children here, brother and sister, we need a temporary home for them. They're in very dire circumstances. Could you take them for two or three weeks? Well, of course I did, because I'd been taking lots of children temporarily from the different volunteering services. After two years, those children were still not able to go back to their parents, and uh, they were put up for adoption, and I requested I be allowed to adopt them. And after a bit of difficulty, I was able to do so. That was number six. Um, it was a struggle. It's not easy to adopt and raise six children from very diverse backgrounds and that have gone through lots of horrors in their lives before I had them. So they were great times, they were good times, but they were also very, very disturbing times. But they've all ended up wonderful, and that's the end of that book, as they ended up really good citizens, good people, and all with good lives, and can't ask for more than that. Jim Collins, the Dreamy Moon Trilogy is released on June the 3rd, uh, an omnibus edition of uh, your three memoirs. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope you'll go out and buy the book. <laughs>